Hi, I'm George Cow, and I'm really excited to be here with Tina Hart. Tina, just want to say hi. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I think we're going to share some things that are going to be really, uh, really helpful for um, people with teenagers in their life or and also adults who are um, dealing with ADHD or uh, other executive function issues. Let me just share briefly what your bio is and then we'll get into this conversation. So uh, Tina Bonehart has 30 years of experience working with teenagers and their families in the mental health field. For the past eight years, she has focused on working with students who have ADHD and anxiety so that they, they can become more productive and enjoy learning. And also in the past uh, year or so, uh, Tina, you've also been uh, working with some adults and um, you know, you worked with some of my own clients who found great benefit from it. Anyway, I, I'm gonna have you share some things that um, you shared with our group that they found really helpful. But uh, should we start with the executive function? What is executive function? I think, I think a lot of us have heard that term um, and we have an idea that, okay, we, you know, executive function, we, we, we need it to well, function well in our work, in our lives. But what is it really? It was so helpful when you shared that, that chart with us. And I'd love for you to share that again here. All right. Well, let me just go ahead and uh, share my screen and show right. you the, yes. gra the graphic that I made. Yes. So um, Russell Barkley, uh, who's now retired, started the idea of executive function and he had like 13 separate ones that he created mm. and then uh, thomas brown at yale university he's a professor of psychiatry furthered that research mm -hmm. and brought out this idea of clusters of executive function mm -hmm. and the idea is is that executive function are all of the ways that our frontal lobe manages our learning, our work, our organization, our emotion, our memory. Mm -hmm. And so um, Thomas Brown put it in this format, which I really like because it kind of, anytime something is containerized, um, it makes it easier for me to remember and work with. Yeah. And so this, this is what he has done. Okay. So the executive function lives in the frontal lobe mm -hmm. behind your forehead and you also have the amygdala, which is right. a triangle shaped huh. gland at the top of your spine in the very back of your brain. Some people like to call that the reptilian brain. Yes, right. Yeah, and so your brain, the energy in your brain works like a coin that's either heads or tails. The yeah. energy is either in the amygdala or it's in the frontal lobe, oh, but it can't be in both. Oh. That's why if you're really upset and you take a test, you can't show what you know on the test because right. your amygdala is firing and the energy is back there in fight, flight, freeze response instead of in your frontal lobe where you're accessing memory and synthesizing information and writing or uh, writing down what you know. So the important thing to know about executive function to begin with is that if your brain is calm, you'll be able to access these much easier. Mm. So the other thing that Thomas says is that this is a continuous process of attention that involves all six clusters. So some people think, well, if I just get started, then everything's good. Or if I just put in a lot of effort, then things are good. But what the way Thomas Brown explains it is, is that, that we really kind of need a continuous function of all six of these clusters so that we can have our highest level of productivity. Yeah. Okay. So I thought that's, that's kind of encouraging and daunting at the same time. Yes, of course. But the, um, the hope is that we can, we can actually plan and work on these things. Is that right? Or, or to be aware of how these things are, are supported and, and not supported. Absolutely. Because our brain has neuroplasticity, we yes. are not stuck with right. any um, executive skill weaknesses. We can continue even uh, the best time to do it is before the age of 26 when your brain mm. is fully developed. Uh, but well. <laughs> we can continue <laughs> even after that. 
<laughs> even after the age of 35, when we start cognitive decline, we can right. still continue to strengthen and work with our executive function. Um, I, I mean, I, I heard somewhere that, you know, uh, so the brain cells continue, <laughs> and it's showing my age, uh, the brain cells continue developing um, until, the, until the last day of your life on earth. I mean, right? Isn't that right? Like, like it's the neuroplasticity from what I, from what I read somewhere, <laughs> my, my brain needs some help, is, uh, is actually throughout the one's whole life. Yeah, the neuroplasticity is, it isn't, um, it isn't actually generating new brain cells as much as it's creating new neuro pathways between. That's right. Them. Okay. Okay. There we go. And so you're able to create new, um, what happens with executive function. And like when people say to me, Oh, I want you to help me strengthen my executive function. Well, what it means to strengthen an executive function is that you've worked with it enough and you've created a new pattern mm. for habit. And so it actually okay. habit bypasses the executive function and it goes, it just goes into a, like a, a little uh, neural pathway that's already been blazed for how to get started or how to focus or how to manage your effort or how to, how yeah. to, that's why meditation works for emotion. Uh, so I thought what I would do is just kind of go over each of these clusters and explain yes. them in a little more detail so That'd that you can understand it. The most hopeful thing about the executive function though, is to remember we all have weaknesses in some areas, you know, and people with ADHD have more weaknesses than others. It's on a continuum of severity. Okay. So you may see yourself in a lot of these and think, Oh my gosh, maybe I'm ADHD. Well, it doesn't matter if you are or not, as long as if you're functioning as well as you want to be, um, there isn't any reason to seek a diagnosis. If, however, you see these things and you're like, this is exactly why I'm having such a hard time, then it might be helpful to seek a diagnosis. But it yeah. isn't necessary because everybody has some executive function weaknesses. That's just the way it is. Yeah, and, and when you mentioned ADHD uh, folks have weaknesses, they also have some strengths, right? Like Oh, they have incredible like, strengths. Yeah. yeah, they're great. They're creative, out-of-the-box thinkers. They're 300% more likely to be entrepreneurs than the average person. Yay. Yay, us. And, uh, and, they, and they, um, they're creative. They're charming. They are um, very smart. Um, there is, oh, you know, shucks, the, Tina. The area of the brain that ha holds intelligence and the area of the brain that holds the executive function are two different areas. Mm, okay. So when people think, oh, well, if you're ADHD, you must not be very smart. Oh. That's just categorically untrue. Okay. That's good. So, let, so let's yeah. look at this first one. Great. Oh, and the last thing I wanted to say uh, in the intro is that if one cluster tends to show improvement, it has a global effect so that all of them improve a tiny bit. Oh, that's great. Uh, and that came straight from uh, Dr. Brown's uh, research. So the activating, we're starting on the top left-hand corner and we're gonna be moving across to the top three and then we'll go to the next stage um, for the next three. So the first stage is called activation. And activation is about organizing prioritizing and activating to work. So one of the biggest difficulties for people who have weaknesses in the activation area is that they have an incredible difficulty getting started. Um, it's their primary complaint and procrastination and resolving procrastination is usually their main goal. Mm. So many wait until the task reaches emergency proportion and they have immediate future consequences to do the task. And some very bright and quick people can live like that their whole life. They might irritate others in their life, <clears throat> but they're able to stay up, pull all-nighters, and get things done anyway. For other people, they can't. They have recurrent failure to pay attention to enough detail and poor predictive skills on how long something will take, That's and they just can't do it. You know what? Um, Predicting how long something will take is <laughs> one of those things that we we all have to learn so much about throughout our career. Yeah, it's such a hard thing to learn. And for some people who have are more moderate to severe ADHD, they just won't learn it. 
So they, they need to just um, give themselves more time than the average bear and, and make yeah. peace with it. Yeah. Um, so another thing that you'll see with people who have weakness in the activation area is they'll have a to-do list that's like long enough to take two to three months and they'll tell you they're going to get it done in a week. And, now, so, and, and it's again, it's the not predicting how long things take. And it's having a very creative, bright, fast moving mind that can have, create way more ideas and generate more ideas than you could possibly do. And we can all think of people like that, maybe ourselves. <laughs> yes, yes. And so that's why I'm a big proponent of the rule of three, trying to accomplish no more than three things a week and no more than three tiny tasks a day to reach those three goals. Yeah. And then and you have, then you're able to corral it a bit and it makes your prioritizing easier. My gosh, if we finish the three, it's like, great. I at least I've done the three today. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's right. And then you can feel good about it. And it doesn't feel like you still have an avalanche of work to do and get so discouraged that you stop. Excellent. So next we have focus. This is the area that most people think of with a with ADHD people, they think, well, they just can't focus. Mm. They have a hard time focusing or they're, or they're impetuous. Um, but the truth is when their brain is activated by a high interest or by a tight deadline, they can focus better than neurotypical people. They have a capacity yeah. to hyper-focus, right. which um, means that they can do it longer, harder, with more vitality hmm. um, than most people can. Wow. The downside of hyperfocus is that it can sometimes wear you out, wear you out so mm. much that you take several days off and then you lose consistency. Oh. And hyperfocus is also something that you can't necessarily will to happen. It is a certain um, mixture of um, lighting up of the brain that happens that causes that flow to go. And so just like you teach all your clients, don't wait on the flow, don't wait on that hyper focus, go ahead and do it, do work consistently. And if it comes, it's a bonus is definitely an agreement with the research here on executive function. Okay, that's interesting. Now, the hyper focus, is it also losing track of time? Does that happen? Yes, yes, you get into such a flow state um, that you people, somebody could even be talking to you and you wouldn't even hear them. Interesting. Okay. Huh. Um, the common complaint in the focus area for people is that they have a hard time focusing long enough to complete necessary tasks because mm. of excessive distractibility. And so everybody has distractibility that's normal and natural. But if you have a, a chronic or severe difficulty, uh, with screening out distractions. It can cause problems in your jobs, driving, um, and in social relationships. Okay. So those are the three areas. The number one killer um, in ADHD teenagers and young adults is car accidents. Oh. So I either recommend that kiddos put off driving until they're a little older yeah. or that they um, consider using medication to keep themselves safe. Yeah, or consider doing Uber or Lyft. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Or public transit if it's yes, available. Yes, public transit. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So then we'll move on to effort. Um, effort is regulating alertness, sustaining effort, and processing speed. So many people who have this as an executive weakness will end up becoming so drowsy they can barely keep their eyes open mm. when they sit quietly for a long period of time. And they also have a hard time driving long distances um, without also having a tendency to fall asleep at the wheel. Um, their <laughs> brain just kind of has a tendency to go to sleep yes. when they are calm and quiet. Right. And it doesn't necessarily have to do with sleep. Sometimes it mm. is. Okay. A lot of people um, sleep deprived. Yeah. Yeah, they're sleep deprived, yeah. or they have a still have a lot of hyperactivity in them, and they might not have enough exercise to burn that mm. out, and that causes sleep problems at night. But this is something that Dr. Brown has noticed across the board with people who have issues with their effort, is they have a really hard time regulating alertness. 
Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I recommend to some of my clients who have issues with this is to get a standing desk. Yeah. Um, okay. Because it is my, it, it reminds your brain that you're awake. Um, right. if you're not sitting, um, the, they have the biggest difficulty staying alert. Um, if there isn't any motor activity, right. If, if there's no social feedback, right. Or if there's no cognitive feedback. And so this is why and what is cognitive feedback? Cognitive feedback. Yeah. What is um, that? That means that, um, if, if you like, if you play a video game and right. you're thinking about the strategy you're going to do, yes. the video game gives you back cognitive feedback about what to do next. Yeah. But if you're doing research to write right. a blog post, yeah. you're, nobody's giving you anything back, maybe an occasional yeah. surprise in the research, but not enough to really sustain. Effort. Ah, got it. So, so in other words, get bored easily. Not just bored. It's literally the brain goes sleepy. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. It's interesting. Like, I, I think I have some of that too. I, I have, I, I, um, it's interesting because I know this doesn't turn into a therapy session for me, but just to share with people, like I, I have a hard time reading books, I'm just reading. Um, yes. our articles are okay for me, but literally I can't read. I, I, it's been like this all my life. I can't read more than a page or two before I start getting sleepy. Right. And what I would recommend to somebody who wants to learn how to read books like that is to listen to it on audio and read it out loud at the same yeah, time. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, I could totally do audio books. I can't, I can't read words yeah. on the screen. It's hard for me. Yeah. So in this idea of, of regulating alertness, this is why co-working sessions work so well. Ah. And, I, and, and you're the one that introduced me to Focusmate, which I'm so grateful because it's foundational in both my productivity in my life and in and a lot of my students that I work with and, and, and a lot of the adults I've, I've, I've told yeah. about it. And, and it's you, because you get social feedback. You look yes. up and you see there's hey, a human somebody there. Working. And uh, you facilitate co-working sessions for, for your clients, for your yes. students. Yeah. Yeah. And one in uh, my accountability group, I provide five a week. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I switched. Uh, I used to do Amazing. two a week and I switched to five because of the pandemic and wow. all the online and remote learning is just really hard for kids to get started yes. and hard for them to focus and to right. also regulate their alertness. Inspiring. That's cool. Very good. So um, processing speed is another thing that happens in this. So there's regulating alertness. They're sustaining mm -hmm. the effort past 20 minutes. Mm -hmm the most um the people who have the most weakness in effort can't sustain it in 20 minutes and so you just create 20 minute work sessions oh um, okay the average neurotypical person usually can't sustain effort past 45 minutes so um right. it's okay if you're anywhere between 20 and 45 minutes you just pay attention to yourself right. accept where you're at and create your study sessions or your work sessions around that and then when you're ready, and only when you're ready, you can start adding on two to three minutes at a time. That's so interesting. This, so, this is so interesting because I feel like I, I, have, I have this weakness because I, I feel like I have to like stretch almost every five to ten minutes because I get, I get bored. I mean, I, within my own work, I'm like, okay, yeah, I got to come back. <laughs> so this is really, this is fascinating. So, so in other words, everybody has different strengths like it's almost like there's these meters for each one of these, right? It's like everybody has a different level of these. And everybody has a different level of creating either a conscious or unconscious uh, accommodation or adaptation to it. That's yes, what right, right. Done. Like we, we figure it out how to cope. Yeah, yeah like yeah, when you yeah. say, I have to stretch about every five minutes, well, that yeah. would be a motor yes. uh, accommodation. Yes. Yeah, I need I You need know, you some, know that yeah. if you move your body, then you're yeah. able to engage your brain yes, again. Yes, yes, yes. No, yeah, good. it's it, the brain is is with all of its interesting complexities, we are driven toward health and we are driven toward wholeness. And so we create all the time these accommodations for ourselves that we don't even know we're doing. And, and if and, we can and if we can realize them and just increase them a tiny bit or just encourage it or just celebrate it, it'll it'll even go faster. What, what about people who fidget, like people who like are moving their legs all the time. Is that part of the accommodation that, or is that something else? <laughs> Maybe that's something else. 
Yeah, it could be, it could be hyperactivity. I mean, okay. what you'll see in a hyperactive person is as in their boyhood, they might be like climbing the walls, but by the time they're 25, they're jiggling their knee so hard it moves the ch table a little bit, you right, know, right, yeah. or, or they, they have some sort of a little, you know, hypermotor activity, like they'll touch their thumb until the fingernail doesn't grow or they'll yeah. do some small thing they, yeah. because they, they unconsciously become more socialized so got that it, they it. aren't, you know, all over yes. the place anymore. That's right. Um, but huh. that might be a little different than the effort. Okay. Okay. Uh, the effort area. Sorry, my fell out here. So let's move on to emotion. To emotion yeah. Cause this is a big one. Managing frustrations and modulating emotions yeah. are what's here. Wow. In the beginning, um, when they were identifying executive function, they didn't they didn't include emotion as part of it. Huh. Um, Russell Barkley, his big thing was that um, being able to inhibit your own behavior was the most important thing. Mm. And so Thomas Brown is the guy who brought emotion on board. And, and looked at his, at how important it is. And the thing is, is that if you have a weakness in the emotion area of your executive function, then you are going to have a low threshold for frustration. Interesting, okay. So that looks like a short fuse, right. you know, you get angry easily, or it looks like irritability, yes. or and this is my own I'm adding, this isn't from Thomas Brown, but I see this in myself and in my clients a lot, is a really low patience right. threshold. Yeah. So it's like, I don't wanna learn that, you know, or I don't wanna do that, or that doesn't right. work for me. Um, and it's because they feel fearful that they won't be able to do it, or, yes. they, ha or they are flooded with emotion. Yeah, and, and with but, technology these days, that's, yeah. It's very and prevalent. With, and with our changing world, because, yeah. you know, somebody with a low frustration tolerance may have put a ton of effort into learning how to use their iPhone 10. Right. And then their iPhone 12 comes out and it's like starting over and it's yeah. extremely frustrating. Right. 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 Um, <clears throat> so that some people with weaknesses in this area also have a chronic difficulty regulating emotional experience and talking about their feelings. So they won't even know what they're feeling. Interesting. And so um, a lot of a lot of my students need just basic emotional literacy. Like I teach them what their feelings are and how to recognize their feelings. That's so this is so this is so important. I, I feel like we don't learn that in school. That's right. I mean this is incredible. I, I feel like I've had to learn that a lot over the years myself because I also was uh, easily frustrated uh, when I was younger and didn't know how to describe, didn't know what I was feeling. And so this is, this is very interesting. Yes. This is actually one of my favorite parts being a former therapist. Yeah. Um, because it's a part of my wheelhouse and I enjoy it a lot. And it's right. part of what I see people being able to go from being mad at themselves to being able to accept themselves once they can identify and express yes. their emotion. Yes. Yes. And, so many people also describe who have a weakness in this area um, th that they, they have an emotional flooding and it mm. feels like that there's no space left in their brain except for that emotion. And sometimes people will lose entire days, not just mm. a day or not just an hour, but entire days to a, wow. a big emotional distraction. Yeah, right, right. So that would look like a breakup. Yeah. Or oh, a, oh, yeah. Big, big events like that, you know, grieving yeah, or, or yeah. yeah, or even failing a test. Yeah, or, sure. Of course. Or like embarrassment. Um, yeah. Having a fight with a parent. Right. Um, right. So many also describe themselves as overly sensitive and react too intensely to criticism. Mm. Um, I don't see that. I do think that they're sensitive. Um, a lot of of, of my kiddos are very sensitive, but I don't think that they react too intensely to criticism in light of they have been overly criticized most of their life because they weren't neurotypical. Ah, okay. Um, but half of all people with ADHD have coexisting diagnosis of ADHD, depression, or other learning disabilities. Wow. 
so since it is at the halfway mark, uh, if you uh, if you see a lot of executive weaknesses on here for yourself, and you know you also deal with those other things, treatment will take you to the halfway mark. Uh, medication will take you to the 50% mark of curing this stuff, and then you're able to have a good solid base to continue working on the habit forming right. and all the other um, executive skill strengths that you need. Wow. So wow. moving on to memory. Yes. Yeah, we have just a few minutes, and I just want to make sure we, yeah. Yeah, so I'll try to just buzz through these two pretty quick yes. here. Memory, utilizing memory working memory and assessing recall. The most important thing to learn about this is to know about this executive function is that if you have a working memory deficit or weakness, then you are going to have a hard time keeping two things in mind at one time. Mm -hmm. Even if you set up templates and even if you set up systems for yourself, you may forget those systems and templates without a visual reminder. Ah, uh, okay. So if you don't do anything else for your memory, what I would encourage you to do is to get in the habit of writing things down. Oh yeah. And using it as a visual memory. So yes. that, and telling people that you have social conversations with, I'm not good with names, but I'll remember your story. Yes. Things like that. So that you let them know on the front end that this is a weakness for you and it's not a character fall yeah, or yeah, right, it's right. it's not a slight against them yes yes and then moving on to action this is monitoring and self-regulating action this is four areas that i want to just share with you real quick one is in in inhibit inhibition of action which is just essentially stopping and thinking mm. before you do something or speak the second one is monitoring yourself, which is developing and observing ego, which you can do in just in, in mindfulness meditation so that you can see yourself in your environment instead of, of not paying attention to cues other people are giving you and not changing your behaviors to get along better with others. There's monitoring one's context in terms of what's appropriate when so that right. you know this context, it's okay to say this, but this context, it's not. Um, and then taking action in appropriate ways. So instead of freezing up, if you start freezing up, what will you do? Well, I'll do a four breath reset and then right. I'll look up my template so that you know what you'll do if you start freezing up. Wow. I, I feel like I'm, <laughs> I've had to learn a lot, grow a lot in that area as well, that, that, that those things that you've, you've talked about. And, and I'm still learning what's appropriate and not appropriate <laughs> and, and, uh, and very much, uh, you know, not, not being too impulsive, but it's interesting because you said that a lot of ADHD people become entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship is kind of an impulse, you know, there's that, there's that, there's an impulsiveness there. It's like, Oh yeah, I can do this. I, I'm going to do it right now, you know, kind of thing. Which And I think one of the reasons why, um, so many people with ADHD are entrepreneurs is because the risk keeps your brain alive. You know, it yeah. keeps it on uh, because <laughs> it's, it's the risk is high. It's much higher yeah. than being employed and getting <laughs> right. a job from somebody again. Very interesting. Very interesting. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Tina, this has been amazing. Um, I hope folks who are watching this feel um, whether it's for yourself or for um, a child a grandchild, a niece, nephew, someone in your life, a young adult, or, you know, like I said, whether it's for young adults and yourself, I hope you feel some acceptance, you know, like more understanding of what might be happening if somebody is not uh, behaving the typical ways that most people behave, perhaps. Um, so, Tina, you have, you work with, of course, you've been working with um, teenagers, young adults for, for years now. Um, uh, on helping them develop these habits. You, you actually work with a lot of high school students and college students to help them. Um, actually, mostly college yeah, students. Mostly yeah. college students mm -hmm. to, to help them uh, study better and kind of thrive in their academic environment. Yes. Um, and, and then now you've, uh, you know, you've worked with some of my clients uh, and others to, you know, adults, based, you know, people of uh, people who are, you know, 35 plus um, or 25 plus who are needing some habit development in these areas and some improvement in these areas. And right. you have something called the productivity audit. Yes. And that a lot of my clients have found helpful. Do you want us to talk about that? Yes. So um, a, a new thing that, I, that I, I 
tested this past summer and it was well received and now I'm offering on a regular basis yeah. through my website. You just go to my website at um, coachingwithhearthart.com. I'll have the link below. Yeah. yeah. And there is a uh, make an appointment tab. So you just go in there and sign up for one. It's a productivity audit. It lasts for 60 minutes. And I have created a uh, Google form that you fill out that has targeted questions helping me do a shortcut assessment of which of these areas you might have some weaknesses or stuck areas in. And then we create a very practical, actionable plan for you to immediately implement as soon as the session is over. That's excellent. I love it. And I, I, like I said, my, my clients who've signed up for that, who've done that, found it incredibly helpful, um, you know, transformational for them, for their work. So I hope those, those who are watching this will take you up on this. And, and while you have this available, um, I'll have the link below. Tina, thank you so much for what you do. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you.